So I'm joined today by um, Andrew Glass from Avatar Commodities. Uh, thank you for joining us, Andrew. Pleasure. Thank you. You deal a lot with risk and helping manage, helping companies deal with risk. Um, I wonder uh, how you think the coronavirus this year has has changed the the risk environment and how you deal with that. Um, look, it's been extremely interesting. Obviously, we all know that 2020 has been one of those outliers as far as years are concerned, and particularly with risk. And we had it the previous year in 2019, I believe, um, you know, with with the impact around um, the tragedy in Brazil. Actually, it was 2018, sorry. Um, but so we've had a lot of volatility for a while, but this year's off the chart as far as volatility is concerned, just throughout the whole ecosystem, right? because um, it's not necessarily been fully reflected in the volatility being traded. Um, what I think is also the a big issue this year as well is how companies respond to working from home, um, how they manage risk in that scenario, how they keep on top of both phys physical and financial risks, but also the people risks right around supporting their people, supporting also their customers and their suppliers throughout the ecosystem. And I think those that are in positions of uh, liquidity and have access to capital, they have a moral obligation also to help um, those throughout their ecosystem with risk. And again, that's physical and financial uh, and very much people orientated. Thanks. Can you put that in, in a bit more uh, specific terms in terms of, uh, you know, if you're a large company with a lot of credit, um, you're talking here about supporting upstream or downstream companies that maybe are in a, a more vulnerable position. Is that what, that what you mean? Yeah, look, I mean, I, this, this, if we take a step back on that one too, and we start with companies' own internal risk profiles, I think those companies that have the ability to manage risk and, and both physical and financially, um, they've sort of evolved away from just transactional. Um, they've built the platform to be able to then extend those capabilities to help their clients, um, both suppliers and customers. Now. What I find is in a lot of the cases, particularly in the iron ore industry amongst producers in particular, is they haven't really built out that trading capability. Now, trading is a scary word for a lot of people and there's, there's perceived to be risk around it, but it depends how it's implemented, it depends how it's structured. Um, and I'm very much about making sure that everything that I do with clients that I work with is on the twin values of accountability and transparency. Um, and that's fundamental, right? They're the building blocks. You then build out your own ability to manage risk. Now, we've seen risk, for example, um, we've seen what I used to call back in March that we were anticipating to see asymmetrical price risk. And what I mean by that is fear was a major driver of big moves up and small moves down. Um, and that's what I mean by asymmetrical. I mean, the chance of big it shifted very quickly, but it dribbled down. Um, so we saw this. Now, that creates kind of systemic risk for particularly for further down the supply chain for those that are trying to buy product and they have a responsibility to their owners, their shareholders, their stakeholders to produce a margin. Um, in that case, they should be using all tools at their disposal and that are available in the market um, to mitigate that risk as best they can. Um, so setting up these abilities to manage risk is extremely important. Now, flow that back down the value chain and you've got producers who've been able to capitalise on fantastic values this year. Um, but again, I think that the producer could put in place um, trading capability, particularly risk mitigation, that then can evolve into being able to offer bespoke solutions to your clients, especially when you go through your client list and you look at your KYCs, um, know your customer, look at which one's going to be the best credit risk moving forward and partner with them. Um, help them to do well. Um, help them to keep people employed. Um, give them alternative pricing structures uh, that are going to suit their kind of business. Um, give them different FX. Why do we always have to transact in US dollars and push towards yuan? Why shouldn't it be Korean won, Japanese yen, South African rand, whatever it may be? So in terms of um, risks that are coming forward in, in the coming year, we've obviously had a very dramatic year in terms of the coronavirus, but presumably there'll be new and different risks uh, emerging over the next 12 months. What do you see going forward? Um, I see that we're going to have, I mean, there's a lot of liquidity going around the system at the moment. 
um, as far as I'm talking in general there. I mean, if we look at equity markets, um, we look at the performance of gold. I think we've got a lot of volatility that's moving through the market as well, as far as obviously the political <laughs> environment right now, um, the trade war, um, saber rattling over Taiwan. I mean, there's so many macro issues that we're going to have coming up, which will contribute volatility. So again, you know, work on your risk capabilities to manage those risks internally using all the tools available in the market with transparency and accountability. Now, as far as the risks coming forward, I think one of the biggest issues we've had this year across the commodities ecosystem has been the frauds that we've seen coming out of Singapore. Um, not just Singapore, sorry, I mean, I should also talk about there was companies out of Dubai. This, is, this has been there the whole time. This has been a major issue. Um, it only comes to light once we have huge moves in the underlying price of the commodity that's being financed. Only then do things come unraveled because those that are financing the commodities and doing inventory financing then come looking for their collateral and then find out that it's been multiple pledged. And again, this is unsophisticated fraud. The important point here is this can be solved. There is technology that's been around for well over a decade. You look at blockchain, for example, electronic bills of lading. I mean, there is no reason that that BL should be forged if it was electronic with blockchain support behind it. Um, and given, to, but the ecosystem in the banks, for example, and those financing has actually encouraged it effectively because if that's been pledged to six financial organisations, each one of those is able to get to their KPIs, put money out the door, get revenues in. Um, so. The whole ecosystem needs to change. Finally, I think we've now got the government here in Singapore um, through its various organisations and, and the MAS pushing very hard the major financial institutions to change their behaviour when it comes to this. So the fraudster, that's black and white. But the ecosystem needs to change. And hopefully COVID is creating opportunities for an inflection point digitalisation to really shift the industry to where it should be. So whose responsibility is it really to push that? Because I remember speaking uh, maybe seven, eight years ago with companies trying to push um, uh, you know, electronic documentation and so on. And they were always struggling to convince banks in particular, but also um, you know, holders of inventory that it was in their interest because obviously in a sense, it's not in their interest. It's in their interest to scam the system. <laughs> No, Tom, you, you, I mean, you're spot on, right? And, and the thing is, the technology and the innovation is very hard to argue against. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, and, and that's what surprises people. They come up with these ideas and there's great innovation in the space, frankly. I mean, I see it throughout the whole ecosystem of, of commodities. There's great inventions out there. The problem is the incumbents that are incentivized not to adopt it. Right? And they will talk it because it's part of their KPIs, talk about innovation and, and what we're going to do and digitalization and stuff as well. But at the end of the day, there's a problem here. The one that is multiple pledging for multiple financing of inventories is able to get a lot of cash in the door to be able to go and punt on or buy the next cargoes, right? So there's a, there's a financial, significant financial incentives and high likelihood you're never going to get found out. It's only again when we get a catastrophic move in price that people come after the underlying collateral and then it unravels, right? But it's the same on the other side, on the bank side. I mean, kind of the financiers sit there and sort of scream blue murder when this happens, but they have actively avoided implementing technology that can avoid this issue. Because again, KPIs and the requirements for them and, and the needs for them to make their, their financing targets mean that they're incentivized to maintain the status quo. And this is part of the problem. And this is why I believe that we also need strong governments and regulators. And regulators are strong right, in a lot of ways. But are they actually really driving some of these digitalization initiatives as much as they should? Because they need to change the incentives that are there in the, in the, um, in, in the current structures. Otherwise, the adoption rate is never really going to happen. But I'm hoping we've hit an inflection point in that. So what's your outlook uh, for that? I mean, we've seen some progress in terms of, um, you know, at some uh, uh, blockchain enabled contracts for iron ore recently. How long do you think it will be for that to become a, a more standard practice? Look, I, I, I think it is becoming more of a standard practice. We've seen announcements out of most of the majors, if not all the majors, producers, 
talking about blockchain technology and they've used electronic BLs of late. And there's a big song and dance about it. And it's great, right? That's that's fantastic. They're a bit slow to the party on this, but that's that's fine. We, we're getting there. I mean, a lot of the miners like to talk about the journey that we undertake, right? Okay, it's a journey. Um, but we're getting there. And that's the good thing. It's positive momentum. I think the other thing that stimulated this as well is, is, is the fact that their employees are having to work from home. I mean, documentation, um, having to run all that from your, uh, effectively a home office and disseminated. I mean, when I was in a, in a major, for example, I could not trade from home. There was rules and regulations on, on, on myself not being able to trade from home. Now, <laughs> they've had to scramble to fix that situation because you need to mitigate the risk that you're sitting on. So it's forcing the digitization in a number of different areas of the business and the value chain and hopefully that will cause an epiphany <laughs> to resonate throughout the industry um, that they need things like um, you know, more stable systems to be able to work from home um, electronic documentation and there's plenty again there is plenty of options out there in the digital space of great innovation to do all this kind of stuff so um, I think particularly people who are struggling with working from home and, and how they how they shift their mentality from that perspective. And I don't think it's going away anytime soon. And if at best we're going to see a mix of the two, um, then again, hopefully, I'm very, very um, optimistic that this is one of the best chances we've got to really take a, a, a leap forward um, in digitalization in the industry for the betterment of all, by the way. And the other thing too is, by the way, a lot of people also think that digitization means people losing their jobs. I don't, I don't particularly believe in that and I don't subscribe to that. What I do think is, what it does is it alleviates a lot of the menial tasks that are involved in documentation, for example, in ops. But what that does is it frees up people with a lot of knowledge who've otherwise been been cumbered with the requirements of their job and this, this very sort of repetitious stuff to think differently, right? to come up with ideas because everyone has got something to contribute. Um, and I think that's important too, um, freeing up the, 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 the humans involved to be able to contribute um, in a better and deeper way um, to value for the organisations and their stakeholders. Thank you. Well, that's a very optimistic note to end on. So I'm um, glad we're getting something positive out of the, such a troubled year. Um, thanks again for joining us, Andrew. Pleasure, Tom. Thanks very much.